What do you think of when you hear the word antenna? Most people probably think of the telescoping receive antennas you commonly see on old boom boxes, or in this case on my tiny SA spectrum analyzer. It could be a TV receive antenna on your roof. If you're into amateur radio, it may be something like the Diamond NR770 VHF UHF monopole you mount on your car, or a large rotatable beam antenna used on the HF bands. What do we do in broadcasting? Do we just supersize one of these whip antennas, slap it on a tower, and call it a day? Well, not exactly. Let's nerd out and explore some basics of antenna systems used in broadcasting. I'll try to keep the math to a minimum. First of all, I should tell you that I'm going to use a particular term a lot in this video. In RF and audio engineering, you hear the term decibel, or its abbreviation, dB, a lot. This is a measurement unit, but it's special in that it's only ever used to compare two values. It means nothing on its own. The decimal is a logarithmic comparison, which means that a signal half as powerful as a second reference signal is said to be at minus 3 dB. A signal 10 times weaker is at minus 10 dB, and a signal 100 times weaker is minus 20 dB. This logarithmic scale helps express large ratios and easy to manage numbers. In antenna theory, we use dBi, which is decibels relative to an isotropic radiator. What's that? An isotropic radiator is a theoretical point source antenna with perfect efficiency that radiates waves equally in all directions. Something like this doesn't exist in the real world, but it's useful to compare real antennas to. This comparison is referred to as an antenna's gain, a factor of magnification of the electromagnetic energy field. Notice I didn't say amplification, because an antenna is a passive element and cannot amplify its input signal. We'll talk more about gain in a few minutes. When designing antenna systems, you also need to know the wavelength of the frequency you're using. This is because an antenna works best if it's a certain fraction of the wavelength and electrical length, or a multiple of that same fraction. For a dipole antenna, that magic fraction is half a wavelength. In equations, wavelength is usually shown as the Greek letter lambda. Let's go back to the diamond in R770, which is a monopole antenna. Since a monopole is half of a dipole antenna, the target fraction is also halved, one quarter wavelength. It's 102 centimeters long, which makes it about half the wavelength of a signal at 146 megahertz. How do we know that? The equation to find the wavelength of a radio wave is lambda equals c, the speed of light, divided by frequency in hertz. Plug in your values and you see the wavelength at 146 megahertz is 2.05 meters, or 205 centimeters. This antenna works at that frequency because even though it's a half wave antenna, that's a multiple of a quarter wavelength. In the 88 through 108 MHz FM band, wavelength is somewhere around 3 meters. In the medium wave band used for AM broadcasting in the US, the wavelength is anywhere from 200 to 600 meters. That's the last of the math, I promise. Another thing to be aware of is wave polarization. With simple monopole antennas like this, it's simply a matter of physical orientation of the antenna. When this antenna is vertical, it transmits and receives vertically polarized radio waves. If it's horizontal, well, you get the point. You may have noticed I also said the antenna receives signals with the same polarization as its positioning, which may not make a whole lot of sense because I literally just said this is a completely passive element. It may help to think about it this way. A vertically polarized radio wave, for instance, can, for lack of a better term, touch more of this antenna's surface if it's mounted in the same orientation. In fact, a 90 degree polarization mismatch will knock 54 dB off the signal on the receive side. Remember, decibels are logarithmic, so minus 54 dB is 0.0004%, essentially wiping out your signal. As an aside to public safety folks, if you hold your radio sideways because you think it looks cool or it's more convenient, you may notice your dispatcher has trouble hearing you. This is why. As Clapton and Robertson once wrote, it's in the way that you use it, boy, don't you know? Virtually all public safety and land mobile radio infrastructure uses vertically polarized waves, they do slap supersized whip antennas on towers. Anyway, back to broadcasting. People have their FM radios in all sorts of places and orientations. How do we avoid polarization mismatches? I'm glad you asked. We use special antennas. I actually have an antenna element from an FM station in this storage room. Let me go get it. Huh. Oh. 
That thing's heavy. This is just one piece of a type of antenna system used in FM broadcasting. It doesn't look this big all the way up on the tower, does it? This type of antenna is called a cross dipole or a turnstile antenna. ERI, the company that manufactures this antenna, has an even more fun name for this particular model. Rototiller. Because uh, it does sort of look like the business end of some landscaping equipment. Anyway, these two legs are the active elements in one of these antenna sections. One is fed slightly out of phase from the other, which makes an antenna of this type radiate signals with a circular polarization. Don't ask me how, because let's not forget the RF engineering is straight up wizardry, and I promise no more math. But circularly polarized radio waves travel in sort of a corkscrew or helical fashion. This type of polarization is most commonly found in direct broadcast satellite systems, mainly because the feed horn of the satellite dish you might have on your home can be in all different types of orientations. Using circular polarization makes it so that your dish simply has to point toward the satellite in orbit in order to get a signal without having to worry about a linear polarization mismatch. There are two types of circular polarization, left hand and right hand, or counterclockwise and clockwise. A mismatch between those will behave in much the same way as a mismatch between vertical and horizontal linear polarization, but in this case, polarization is determined by the antenna's design rather than its orientation. In FM radio broadcasting, the term circular polarization is somewhat of a misnomer. Sure, we have to do something to mitigate the effects of a polarization mismatch, but it's more appropriate to vaguely refer to the signals we transmit as having mixed polarity. Antennas like the rototiller will radiate waves with random polarity, but some stations will have antenna arrays with alternating vertical and horizontal elements. There's another new concept, the antenna array. What's that all about? You'll typically see FM stations using collinear antenna arrays to transmit their signals. A collinear antenna array is a type of antenna that consists of multiple identical elements arranged in a line and fed in phase to increase the gain. Having more elements in a collinear antenna array increases gain because it allows the radio signals from each antenna element to reinforce each other, which increases the overall strength of the signals emitted by the antenna. These collinear arrays tend to radiate signals broadside of the array axis, more toward the horizon. The energy field sort of looks like a donut. With higher gain, that donut is flatter and covers more area. If you're wondering, what about AM stations? Well, they mainly use what's called a mast radiator, a type of monopole where the tower itself is the antenna. Those can also be arranged in phased arrays, but I live in the FM world and I'm sure you don't want me to ramble any longer than I have to. Why does antenna gain matter so much in broadcasting? Well, it's one factor that determines the effective radiated power, or ERP, of the station. In the United States, broadcast stations are licensed by their effective radiated power. If you've ever heard a radio station advertise their power levels like 100,000 watts of pure country, or this 2004 promo for an urban AC station in Alabama. The big station is number one for real. WKXF and the 50,000 watt WKXK FM. We've got your number. That's their ERP. For these stations, they don't actually have a transmitter pushing 100 kilowatts because the electricity bill would just be absurd. Typically, you'll see a station licensed for 100 kilowatts ERP having a transmitter power output of 20 to 30 kilowatts into an antenna array of eight or more elements spaced one full wavelength apart. These antenna systems usually have the gain required to overcome the losses in the transmission line and render an effective radiated power close to their license limit. There's math involved in the specifics, and I know I promised no more math, but all you need to know is there's no 100 kilowatt transmitter sitting at the base of these towers. So that's how we apply antenna theory in broadcasting. The concept I discussed today, gain, wavelength, polarization, collinear arrays, ERP, they're all related and firmly within the realm of super, super nerdy interests. However, it's something you need a basic understanding of to be successful in a broadcast engineering career. I could have gone on a lot longer, but this is already a lot of information to cram into about 10 minutes. As always, I'll try to answer questions in the comments below. Be sure to like this video if you found it useful and subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to see more stuff like this from me. You can visit my landing page at airwavearchitect.com to see more social links and ways to get in touch. I'll catch up with you next time.